Okay, let's pick it back up here. Um, we want to talk about easements. These are in your book. Here, uh, page fifty-five. Page fifty-five. We talk about easements. An easement is not a grant of ownership. It is a grant of use. I am maintaining ownership of the property, but I am giving someone else the right to use my property. They don't own it, therefore, do you think they have to maintain it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. No. 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 I, don't, I don't maintain what I do not own. I maintain things that I own. Who, who's going to do the maintenance on this? Is it going to be the property holder or the easement holder? The easement holder. Oh, property holder. The property owner. 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 If someone has an easement, they do not own the property, but they get to what? Use, Use it. it. For how long? Forever. Forever in most cases. They get to use something that they don't own. Can you restrict them from it? No, because the use belongs to them. You cannot stop them. You have given them the right to use your property as if it is their property. That's what an easement is. Almost every single one of you, if you own real estate, have easements on your property. You know how I know that? I hope you took a shower this morning, right? <laughs> how many of you did? Don't know. <laughs> if you did, most of you did so with some sort of a municipal water supply, right? And I'm sure there's somebody out there going, I got a well, if you bother me. <laughs> did you pump the water out of that well by hand? <clears throat> or did you use an electric pump to get it out? And if you used an electric pump, where did the electricity come from? Because unless you've got a windmill or solar panels generating that electricity, you probably have power lines coming to your house. How do you think all those utilities get across your property? Through what? Easements. Because those utility companies don't have to come ask you if they can come on your property to repair that power line, do they? If it falls, what do they do? Fix it. They fix it. And how do they fix it? They drive right across your property. They access your property. And what if there's a fence there? They drive over it. <laughs> because they have the legal right to do so, and you did not have the legal right to put that fence in their way. Because they have the legal right to access that property via that easement. That's what an easement is. It is the legal right to access property which does not belong to you. Is everybody with me on this? Okay. So it is a grant of use. No ownership is granted, just use. So, let's talk about easements. The first type, the appurtenant easement. Well, there's our word again, appurtenant. So what does that tell you about the duration, the length of time of this thing? Forever. This is a grant of use that's going to last literally forever. And it's going to attach to the property. So therefore, who's going to have to honor this easement? Every owner from now until the end of time is going to have to honor this easement. It's not going to go away. Now, things that make a pertinent easement a little different. This first one, I would star that in your notes. Two adjacent lots. Two lots. Put it in your notes and star it. Two lots, not 22, not 15, not one. How many? Two. two. Yeah. Always two lots. And a pertinent easement always involves only two lots. They are always side by side. Here's the reason. A pertinent easement actually benefit lots, not people. One of these lots is going to use some portion of what? The other. One of these lots 
gets the benefit of use of some portion of the other lot that's right beside it. Can you think of a situation where you have side-by-side -side lots and the owners of those two lots share the use of some section of that land? How many of you lived in the country ever? You ever seen a shared driveway? Isn't it on one piece of land or the other? Who gets to use it? Both. That's an easement, folks. Because that piece of land where the driveway is located doesn't belong to both of them. It belongs to how many of them? One. But how many get to use it? Both. And it's not the owners of the piece of property that actually have the benefit of that use. It's the piece of property. And here's how you know it's the piece of property that has the benefit. When the property sold, what happens to the easement? It goes with the property. So who gets the benefit now? The new owners. And then who gets the benefit after them? The new owners. The easement doesn't belong to the people. It belongs to the property. You can't separate it out. That's why it's called an appurtenant easement. We call one of these the servient and one of them the dominant. One is called the servient and one's called the dominant. Just based on those names. Which one do you think is being used? The servient. Which one is taking advantage or doing the using? The dominant. So we have two properties. One of them's called the servient. One of them's called the dominant. Now, give me the definition of an easement again. An easement is the right to use property you do not own, correct? So which one do you think is going to have the easement? The one that's being used, abused, taken advantage of? Or the one that's doing the taking advantage of? Which one's going to have the easement? The, the first one, right? So what do we call that? Servient or dominant? Servient. servient. So where's the easement located? There's your test question. It's on the servient. Of all that to get to that one test question, right? But I had to walk you through it because if I just give it to you memorization, you'll forget it. Now you understand why the easement's located there. Does that make sense for you? Okay. So this is a, a very detailed drawing <laughs> of an appurtenant easement. And this is a shared driveway. In this case, what we have is the road is over here on the left-hand side. And we've got this property that's road frontage. So they have no problem with the driveway. But what do you see as a problem with this property? They have no access to the what? To the road. They have no access to the road. This is another piece of land over here. So they're landlocked. Is that a problem? Yes. Absolutely. So the only way they can get access to the road is by going across this property right here. This is an appurtenant easement. And so this is the dominant property because it gets to use some portion of the servient property. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Now, here's why I want to make your brains work a little bit. I want you to dig a little deeper into this. Why? Why was the owner of this property, we understand it lasts forever once it's created, but why was the owner of this property ever willing to give this up? I mean, surely they don't want somebody driving, I mean, because who's going to maintain this driveway? So yeah. The servant, because it's their driveway. Can you imagine this guy going to knock on your door and saying, Hey, jerk, won't you fill the potholes in out here in our driveway? That you have to pay for, by the way. I don't have to pay for it. Well, he doesn't have to, right? He does. Yep, he he does. could They're be legally it. enforced to do it. They probably won't legally make it. <laughs> Absolutely, you can, depending on how that easement's drawn up. Well, I work for Fish and Wildlife, and uh, D&I are owned a piece of property. And they wouldn't maintain our easement for the life. They don't. It depends on how the easement is drafted. You know, easement usually, if they're smart, would be drafted with some sort of a maintenance agreement that would set up and specify how maintenance is going to be handled on that. Okay. But yeah, you can force them, especially if, you, if it has a maintenance agreement as part of it. Force them to maintain it. Why did they give that up? Why? They wanted to subdivide the property. Mm -hmm. Say that word again. They want to subdivide. The subdivide. At one point in time, folks, this line was not there. At one point in time, this line was not there. It was one piece of land owned by one owner, and they wanted to do what with it? 
subdivide it, split it up. But the only way they could split it up, and they're like, well, I got a problem here. Can an owner give up this right? Yes. And if I'm subdividing, who owns both pieces of property? I mean, you that owner. That one person, right? So, because I wanted to create this subdivision, and the only way to accomplish it was with an easement, can I put an easement on that piece of property? Absolutely. And now when I sell it to somebody else, are they going to have to honor that easement? Right. For how long? Forever. Forever. And every subsequent owner becomes on a pertinent easement. Does that make sense for everybody? So these are usually going to be applied during the subdivision process. They don't have to happen during the subdivision process. I'll give you a very real life example of an appurtenant easement being created. Years ago, I had a transaction going on and I was helping a buyer who was buying a custom built new construction home up here in North Raleigh. And it was on about an acre and a half of land. It was a $1.2 million home. Not an insignificant purchase. And it had a, a, a paved driveway, which was, I would say, an eighth to a quarter of a mile long. The house was set way back on the back of this property. Beautiful approach. It was wooded, you know, and the driveway sort of curved in and out through some trees. So you couldn't really even see the house from, you could, but you had to, you know, look. It was not, you really couldn't see the house from the street. It was set back. Well, we had a survey done because I recommended to my clients that they have a survey done. We're going to talk about surveys later on. And, um, in chapter four and why you would have a survey. No, actually, I'm talking about it in chapter three. You're looking for something called an encroachment when you do surveys. How many of you have ever heard that word, an encroachment? Outside of football, we hear it in football. That's not what <laughs> Encroachments are any improvement. We said an improvement is just something that's been constructed, right, to add value to the property. Any improvement that goes across the property line. We didn't know exactly where the property line was, and we guessed, and we guessed wrong. One of the classic examples of an encroachment is a fence, right? Somebody puts a fence up, they're not exactly sure where their property line is, and they go too far, and their fence ends up on somebody else's property. Here's the problem with an encroachment. If it's on somebody else's property, what can they do with it anytime they want to? Tear it down. It's, you have put something on their property, they can, of course, tear it down. Well, we did a survey on this property, and what we found is that uh, did I mention there was a brick wall that followed the shape of this driveway? This nice curving driveway that went back to the house? It had a brick wall with like sconce lights on it, you know, every so often. Nice. Except in three places it crossed that property line. The widest was by four inches. So we're not talking much. But when you're talking about tearing down a brick wall, is four inches expensive? Yeah. Well, my buyer said, well, what do we do? I said, well, if it were me, I would not buy the property as it currently sits. Because what could your neighbors do anytime they wanted to? Yeah. Tear down that brick wall. And if the rest of it happens to fall down because I'm tearing down the part on my property, oh well, you shouldn't have built it on my property. Does that make sense? Is there some legal mechanism we could utilize that would legally allow that brick wall to sit on somebody else's property? An easement. An easement. Now, could the next door neighbors give us an easement? Yes. Could. Sure. Did they give an easement? No. Now keep in mind, my clients did not own the property at this point in time, so my clients were not the ones having to pay for this easement. It was the builder who was having to pay for this easement. Luckily, the builder had a relationship with the next door neighbor because he also built their house. Did I mention the next door neighbor was an attorney? Oh. And understood the implications of this encroachment and exactly what. And so they did come to an agreement on an appurtenant easement. It was six inches wide and it ran the length of the property line there. And so the attorney, this is how he came up with a number. He met with the contractor who built the brick wall. He asked him a simple question. What would you charge to tear this down and move it six inches over? And the contractor said $30,000. The attorney said $20,000 sounds like a reasonable price for that easement. And that's what the builder had to pay for a six inch easement for that wall. Will he do a survey next time and find the property line before he builds such a wall? 
You see how that could work good? And that's an appurtenant easement. Now, which one's going to be the dominant property? The property I sold or the next door neighbor's property? The next door neighbor's property. No. no. Property I sold is going to be the dominant because it's using a portion of the. So the next door neighbor's property is which one? Serbian. The Serbian. The easement is located on the. Serbian. Serbian. The easement is located on the Serbian side. Okay, that is an appurtenant easement. You see how that works? Okay, and it's going to last forever. Once it's created, it's there forever. So both properties would be involved with that easement. Now, we also talk about. Oh, everybody get on the pertinent easements before I go on with those? How many properties did we say? Two. Two. Always two. We also talk about easements in gross. An easement in gross is different than an appurtenant easement. An easement in gross could involve one property. It could involve hundreds of properties. There's no limitation on number here. Easements in gross benefit people. And I'm going to say this here. Companies are people too. Corporations are people too. Entities are people too. What do we say a pertinent easements benefit? And a pertinent easement benefits what? The property. A property, right? That's why it takes two properties, because you got to have one being used and one benefiting, right? Always with an appurtenant easement. With an easement in gross, it's not a piece of property that benefits. It is a person or a company or a corporation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the easement belongs to someone or something personally. So if the property is sold, does the beneficiary change of the easement? Yes. yes. No. <coughs> no, that's the difference between an appurtenant easement. With an appurtenant easement, what is the easement attached to? The property. the property. So the benefit belongs to whoever happens to own the property at that point in time. With an easement in gross, the property can be sold a thousand times and the beneficiary is always going to be what? The same person, the same right. person that owns the easement. The beneficiary is a specific person or corporation. So like a utility company. Like a utility company. Now, key difference between an appurtenant easement and an easement in gross. An appurtenant easement lasts for how long? Forever. Forever. I'm going to ask you a question. Is there a difference between forever and a hell of a long time? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. One is shorter. Appurtenant easements last forever. Easements in gross last a hell of a long time. <laughs> that wouldn't be in the example of the, the utility company then, because they have a pertinent easement forever, right? How about you just say that in the last example you gave? I did not. I said. <laughs> I'm talking about you were like, the, um, the, they, they can tear down your fence if they want so they can come to your land. I didn't say that was an appurtenant easement. I said it was an easement. An easement. Oh, okay. <laughs> I said it was an easement. And it is an easement. And who does that benefit belong to? To the, to the utility uh, company. Utility. So what is it? What kind of easement is it? Gross. Is it an easement in gross? If the benefit belongs to a person or a company, it is what? Gross. An easement in gross. And the beneficiary is always going to be Duke Power. If I sell the house to somebody else, who's the beneficiary of the easement going to be? Duke Power. Duke Power. If they sell it to somebody else, who's the beneficiary of the easement going to be? Duke, Duke, Duke Power. Power. And how long is that easement going to last? A, a, long long a hell of a long time. <laughs> Specifically, these last until the easement holder dies. All easements in gross. The reason we say they are not forever is because the easement in gross only lasts until the beneficiary dies. Well, in the case of a person, that's not necessarily going to be such a long time, correct? Correct. Because I could have a personal easement in gross, and it's going to go away when? You die. When I die. Simple as that. When the party no longer exists. When the party no longer exists. How does Duke Power die? <laughs> out of business. They go out of business. That's why we say, hell of a long time. <laughs> Because in theory, will it eventually happen? Sure, it will. We know it will. Were there utilities that existed in 1900 which people said, oh, those easements will never go away, that those easements have ceased long 
sense cease to exist? Sure there are. There's always going to be change in it. What we accept as permanent right now could be different 200 years from now. We may microwave in electricity. You may not need power lines to get those things there. They may not need an easement to get it to your house. Does that make sense? Go ahead. I was just going to ask, then, can an easement in gross be transferred then? Can an easement in gross be transferred? If they don't belong to a human person, right. they can. If they belong to a human person, they are non-transferable. So a personal easement in gross cannot be transferred. Can an easement in gross that belongs to a corporation like Duke Power be transferred? They sell it. They sell it right. If they are bought out, absorbed, some kind of corporate merger, their easements can be absorbed by their new subsequent entity. Not doesn't automatically happen, but they can be. Does that make sense for everybody? So if you think about, like, for example, when Progress Energy and Duke Power merged, did they both have easements before the merger? Yes. Do they have easements after the merger? Yes. Are the, is the beneficiary of the easement changed? Yeah, because it's a new company now. And so those easements were transferred to that new company. And they'll now last until that company dies, when it completely goes out of business. And if it were to completely go out of business, the easements would go away. They would, it, they would evaporate instantly, as soon as that. But so define death of a company for me. When it's merged with another or acquired by another. And they don't transfer those easements. They don't renew their corporate filings. It's just gone, right? This has happened. Sometimes it happens accidentally. Do you think corporations can merge and forget to transfer their easements? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ask Norfolk Southern if they've ever dealt with it. How many of you know what Norfolk Southern is? Railroad company, right? Are easements important for a railroad company? Do they own the land that those tracks go across in most cases? No, they have easements on, those la on that land. Would you agree with that? Well, you have to go back in time to realize that it wasn't long ago not that long ago, relatively, that you didn't have four or five major railroad companies in this country. You had hundreds of railroad companies, and they each owned short sections of track. And if you want, and the, and the way many of them made their money was simply by leasing the sections of track. Are y'all familiar with that history in the railroad industry? Well, Norfolk Southern bought hundreds of these small regional rail companies. And they bought them not because they wanted the rail company itself, but they wanted what? The easements that were associated with the track. They wanted the track. Does that anybody make sense for everybody? Well, in, in Western North Carolina, there's a section of track that was owned by a small company. They only ever built about 30 miles of track. That's all this railroad company ever built. They've long since been out of business and were, were sucked into about three different corporate entities before finally being bought by Norfolk Southern. Well. Somebody bought a piece of property for hunting purposes out there. I mean, we're talking middle of the woods property. We are not talking like residential property. We're talking way out in the middle of the woods somewhere in, in western North Carolina. And this person who bought this property for hunting purposes, when he had his survey done, he saw these easements for the railroad track. He knew the railroad tracks were on the property and he saw the easements there. But he saw the name of the easements as some railroad company he did not recognize it. He had never heard of. And he thought, well, that's interesting. And he just, I mean, he just kind of went off on this tangent of looking up this railroad company, and he found that they had gone out of business in, like, 1952. They had been bought by Norfolk Southern. He knew a little bit. He was an attorney. Isn't it funny how that works? You know, it's always an attorney. He knew a little bit, and he thought, well, that easement should show an updated name. If the, the easement was transferred, it shouldn't show us this old company. It should show us... Norfolk Southern. So he went and he found the original easement. You know what he found? It had never been transferred out of the name of the original railroad company. The original railroad company had not filed corporate documents in the state of North Carolina for over 40 years at that point in time. What does that mean about the easement? It didn't exist any longer. Now Norfolk Southern was using that track every single day for freight trains. You know what this guy did? He went to Lowe's and bought one of those sheds. You know, the little pre-built sheds and had them sit it on top of the track. Delivered and sit it on top of the track. Now, what do you think happens that afternoon when the freight train comes through? Stop. Can you imagine a hundred car freight train stopped in the middle of nowhere 
and they had this standoff. I mean, they called like Norfolk Southern's, you know, corporate office, and they sent people in, and the sheriff's department goes out there, and this guy's standing out there with copies of the easements and everything, <laughs> and he says, "Listen, you're trespassing. Get that train off my property. Number one. Number two, I'll be glad to sell you an easement." Oh, wow. In fact, I already got the track built for you. It'd be real simple for you. <laughs> what do you think they did? They bought, they bought it. He also offered to represent the other property owners along that 30-mile <laughs> stretch so that they could also sell Norfolk Southern an easement again. So could that be a costly mistake from a corporate perspective? Now you'll know that corporate easements can be what? Transferred. Transferred. Tell you that story for a reason. They can be transferred. Sometimes they get forgotten to be transferred. Right? And if the easement holder does indeed die, what happens to them? They die with it. The easements die with it. Everybody okay with that? Understand? So that is an easement in gross. Okay? It is not a pertinent to the land because at some point it's designed to do what? Go away. Go away. That's the reason it's not a pertinent. Because a pertinent indicates permanent. And easements and grows truly are designed to go away at some point. It was never considered that these things would last forever. If they were going to last forever, we would just make them what? Permanent. A pertinent. We would make them a pertinent, but they're not. They're designed to go away. Personal easements and grows cannot be transferred. Commercial easements and grows can be transferred, which is why they last so long. And by the way, you know they can just take an easement and grows from you as well. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, how many of you live in Raleigh or Cary? How many, many Raleigh or Cary own your own house? Some of you have a new easement that was just taken from you within the last year. How many of you are excited about Google Fiber coming to town? Mm -hmm. How many of you have had them bury their cable in front of your house? Mine. And cut a water. Yeah, they cut the water line yep. for you in the process? Yep. Did they dig up your front yard? And yep. all Did you give them permission to go out no. there and do all that? Nope. Guess what? They have the legal right because they condemned an easement from you. The state of North Carolina gives utilities the ability to condemn that easement and take it from you. Provide no compensation for it either, by the way. Okay? So we, we do have easements and grows that pop up from time to time. But this is just a drawing that shows what where you might see, you know, both a pertinent and easements and grows on the same properties here. The railway would represent an easement in Groves going across these properties, and then of course the shared driveway is an appurtenant easement. Which one of these? Oh, it's labeled there. This is the Serbian, this is the dominant. Are we okay with those? Everybody good with those? Can you feel like you can answer an easement question like this? Good. So there, how do we create easements? We can do it voluntarily or involuntarily. Voluntarily is done by the owner of the property. Okay? Don't worry about studying these for the test. You don't need to memorize express grant or express reservation. Just remember that these are voluntary ways. In other words, you're not being forced to create the easement. You're doing it voluntarily. So, for example, you are subdividing the property and you need to create an easement in order to provide access to it. So, would that be a voluntary type of easement? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Or you're selling someone an easement. Would that be a voluntary easement? Yes. Let's talk about the involuntary ones. An easement by necessity. If the state of North Carolina finds a landlocked property, they will create an easement to provide access to it. Because the state says that you cannot have landlocked property. Now there's a process you have to go through to do it because they have to do research and find out where to place the easement. What they're actually looking for is when did the subdivision happen that created the problem. And so they would go back and try to put the easement where it would have naturally been when that subdivision was done that created the problem. That's the, the goal of an easement by necessity. You also need to know this term by prescription. I love things that happen by prescription because students can't believe this could possibly happen. Yes, ocean comes into play here. Did you know? that if you do something illegally for a long enough time, they just say, oh, the hell with it, you can do it legally now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some things work that way. It's almost like squatters' rights, right? <laughs> Easements by prescription can come into existence when someone, so what is an easement? It is the right to what? 
use somebody else's property. So what could you do illegally for 20 years? Use somebody else's property without the legal right to do so. If you do it for long enough, in this case, 20 years, a court of law in North Carolina may give you the legal right to continue to do it. If you go make that claim and say, you know what, I've been doing it for 20 years and they never told me to what? Stop. Stop. So I should be able to legally continue doing it. That is an easement by prescription. An easement by prescription. And an easement by condemnation is the example I gave you with Google Fiber. That would be the taking of an easement. Yes? Just to be clear, so in the scenario that you just gave where the guy had the tracks on his property, right? Why wouldn't the corporation in this case be able to apply for that kind of prescription? Because he just told them they couldn't be on his property. The one way to stop an easement by prescription, anything that happens by prescription, is to tell them they don't have their permission. Because what it relies on is the owner is being uninvolved. That's the reason the law exists. Because as an owner of property, it's your responsibility to know what's going on on your property. So when you find out that something is happening on your property that's against the law, you're supposed to put a stop to it. So the very point of saying stop prevents them from making a claim of easement by prescription. Now, if the railroad company had caught it before he said anything and filed for an easement by prescription, they would have probably gotten one. Right? Because if they catch it themselves and find out, shit, we're breaking the law. <laughs> and, and then they go to court and say, listen, we just realized we've been breaking the law, but clearly it not, must not be much of a big deal because the people who own this property have never even noticed that we're breaking the law. What is the court likely to do? Right. Agree with them. Right. Say, well, you're right. But if the owner of the property is saying, uh-uh, <laughs> mine, get off. You can't make a claim of easement by a prescription at that point in time. But would it also work if they said, yes, you're welcome to come by and use this as would that release them from from you being able to get a prescription? Yes, if if they so your question is Tara's question is, what if the owner of the property sent a letter to Norfolk Southern and said, You have my permission to use my property. You don't have an easement, but you have my permission. That would work as well. That That is what we call a license. You don't need to know it for the test. It's just permission. The problem with permission is it, if it can be given, it can be what? Taken away. Taken away at any point in time. But that would prevent a claim of easement by prescription because, again, you're doing it now with what? Permission. permission. And if you do it with permission, as soon as they take the permission away, you have to cease using their property. Does that make sense? Yeah. The only way you can make a claim of something by prescription is if the owner has no idea or they know and they're not stopping it anyway. Mm -hmm. So that attorney with that railroad situation, he wanted to represent all them other pieces on that other 30 miles. But if they had been using it, why couldn't they just go ahead and pay him for his little easement? But then if they had been using it for all these years, why couldn't they get a prescription for them other... They could have, except he contacted every um, single one of them before he <laughs> engaged Norfolk Southern. <laughs> the first thing he did was send a certified letter to every single one of them that said, by the way, I'd be happy to represent you free of charge, and I, on your behalf, I'd send a cease and desist letter to Norfolk Southern saying to stop using your property. Because right there, no more easement by prescription. Because you said, get off my land. I caught you, get off. Can't get an easement by prescription. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because the idea of prescription is that the owner is basically being absentee, that they're not paying attention, they're not doing anything. Like, you know, it's your responsibility as an owner of property to protect the integrity of your property. That's the way the state of North Carolina views it. So if you don't do that, then they will just take somebody else's claim. Everybody okay with that? All right? Yes, it was very cool. <laughs> Work, huh? Everybody paid for the property with all the easements. <laughs> <laughs> all right? How do we terminate easements? Well, you don't need to memorize this entire list, but I'm going to point out a couple of them that you ought to highlight so as you go through your notes, you have them. The purpose no longer exists. Well, in the case of like a shared driveway, what was the purpose? To provide what? Access. Access. Access to the land. What if they build a new road 
that accesses the property on another boundary. Does the purpose of that shared driveway exist any longer? No, no. no, it would go away. It would go away. Because it was there to provide relief. Automatically? Automatic. Well, no, not automatically. You'd have to file a petition for it to go away. Uh -huh. But it wouldn't, and it wouldn't be the dominant that would probably file the petition. Who would it probably, it would be the servant, like, get off of my land, right? You know? Exactly, because you're on their property, right? And they would, and as soon as they saw that road come through, so that you now have the ability to access another roadway, it doesn't have to be the same one, it can be another one, they would probably go file a petition to have that easement terminated. Also, merger of the properties. When you talk about a pertinent easement, an easement is the right to use what? Somebody else's property. So if the same owner owns both pieces of property, I can't have an easement over my own property. Does that make sense? If the same person owns both, it's not the right to use somebody else's property, it's the right to use my own property. So that would have the effect of terminating an easement in most cases. So that would be, i tell you what does not terminate an easement. We say abandonment, right? Like if you abandon an easement, it could be terminated. That doesn't happen automatically. You know, lack of use is not abandonment. Don't get walked into that on a test, okay? On a test, they might say, Travis has, you know, an appurtenant, or Travis owns a dominant property, but has not used the pertinent easement in the last 15 years. That is not going to terminate the easement, folks. That, that abandonment is a legal term, and it has to be declared in a court of law. These things don't happen automatically, is the moral to that story. So be leery of those kinds of test answers where it just makes it sound like magically it just went away, okay? Non-recordation would terminate an easement. So easements must be what? Recorded. Recorded. We're going to talk about later in the class. That's according to the Conner Act in North Carolina. The Conner Act says certain things in order to be enforceable in a court of law have to be recorded. Where do we record documents? At the county courthouse. And why do we record them? What is the purpose of recording them? So that the public can access them. Proof to the public that this thing exists. Here's why an easement must be recorded, especially in the case of real property. When you're selling it, isn't it important that whoever's buying a piece of real property know that somebody else is going to have the legal right to access this property that they're about to purchase? Sure. So that easement must be recorded to be enforceable against the next purchaser. If you get the easement, you go through the trouble of buying the easement, and then you don't go to the courthouse and record it, well, guess what? When they sell the property, the next owner is not going to have to honor that easement because they didn't have any way to know it what? Existed. Existed. Because it was not recorded. Does that make sense for you guys why we would have to record them? Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Good. And again, non-use is not necessarily abandonment. So just be careful of that on the test. That's one I've specifically seen before that throws people for a loop. What does excessive use mean? So... That's a tough one, and again, it would have to be a court of law that would decide excessive use. Where we've seen excessive use terminate easements is in like, um, like shared driveways where the where the dominant tenement ends up opening like a trucking company or something, and so they're moving heavy equipment in and out, or they open like a commercial, for, you know, like say it's out in the country and you have a, a shared driveway, you, you've got, you know, two acres that was divided into one acre plots, and there's a shared driveway on one of them, and one person decides they're going to open a, a truck garage out there on their one acre, so it's just like non-stop and heavy commercialized use. That could be considered excessive use and could terminate, the, you know, an easement. You know, but you, again, you'd have to go to court and file for it. You have to petition for it. I have a question. Yep. Um, the easements, um, like you said, the railroad. All, do all easements have markers or just some and you just have to go with Most of them out? don't have markers. Okay. I mean, look at your yard. Mm -hmm. You see any markers out there? I don't on mine. But there are easements all over the place. When that water line is buried in the ground going to the house, that's an easement. Because if it leaks, who's going to come out there and dig it up? State. Town of Cary, right? It's their water line. There's an easement there. The power line going to the house. Duke Power's got an easement going to it. And that means they can go on my property anywhere that that easement exists in order to work on that line. Um, so most easements do not have any sort of visible markers on the property itself. Now, will they show up on the survey? Yes, because the job of the surveyor is to mark out all of those things. 
they're going to mark on that survey where the easements are located because they're going to pull from those recorded public documents and see the easements and they're going to apply them to that survey map so that you can see where the easements are located. Would a, would a survey help you not only know where the boundaries of your property are, but where you could and could not put a fence in your backyard? Yes. Yeah. yeah, because if you've got an easement running across there for like a sewer line or something, people say, does that mean I can't fence it in? I said, well, I didn't tell you that. I said, it means you don't have the legal right to fence it in. Because what is the alternative view of fencing something in? You are fencing something out. And they have the legal right to have access. So can you legally put up a fence across that easement? Not legally. You can put it up, but not legally. And if you put it up illegally, I'm pretty sure they can tear it down for you. Legally. Because who broke the law there? Not them. You fence. That is no different than putting a padlock on somebody's house. They have the legal right to be there and you have locked them out. We don't like to think of it that way because it's mine, it's mine, I own it. But when you have an easement on it, or you've granted an easement on it, they have that legal right to access that. Now, from a PR perspective, that's generally not what they do, unless it's an emergency. If the lights are out and there's a fence up there, I can assure you they are driving over it. 100% assured. And they ain't fixing it after they leave either. But now if they're doing planned work, they will usually come knock on the door and say, you need to remove this section of your fence, you know, we're going to have to access this part of the property. But if we get an ice storm and they have to go back there and access it, they see you, gone, run right over it. And if your dog get out as a result of that, that ain't on them. I mean, I'm just, I'm just telling you. So the reason I tell you these worst case scenarios is your job as a real estate broker is to do what with people? Advise. Advise, Advise and protect, right? Advise and protect. So. When you have a buyer who buys a property that has these easements across the backyard, should you advise them about making sure if you're going to do something like fencing in that you have a survey done and you pay attention to where you can and cannot fence as a result of those easements? One of the things that is a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people, especially in new construction and especially with the size of lots with what we see now, when you start talking about lots that are two-tenths of an acre and you're building a 4,000 square foot house on it, folks, Quite honestly, there's not much of that backyard you can actually put a fence around and be within the law. If you start looking at where the easements are and what the setback requirements are and all those kinds of things. Now, you may indeed put one up and it may never prove to be an issue, but they should know that they're taking a risk by putting it up because they have to provide that legal access if it's ever needed. If it's ever needed. Well, I mean, at some point it will be because at some point they're going to have to be maintenance. It's just a question of whether you own the property at that point in time or not. You can sell an easement. You can't. The, so the beneficiary of an easement in gross can't change. Is that what you mean, sell an easement? Or can I get? So I can somebody buy an easement on my property from me? Is that which way are we talking about? Right. The, I bought a lot that had a house on it that was across from the lake. The owner that sold it uh, sold the easement because he had an easement with the house across the street so he could use the lake. Okay. But he sold that easement to that homeowner before he sold me. Uh, he sold the easement back to the person across the street? Right. Yeah. And he could not have sold you the easement anyway. Oh. Because a personal easement in gross, that's a personal easement in gross, cannot be transferred. Okay. The easement wasn't attached to his so property. He, gave it to me anyway. he could not have given it to you anyway. So what they essentially bought back from him was the right to use the lake for him for the rest of his life because that's what he had. Yeah, he could not have sold you his easement in gross. Why would he sell it? Back to them? I didn't say they knew what they were doing. Because he was going to lose it anyway, right? When he died. I mean, when he sold the house. No. The easement and the house are two entirely different things. If he sells you the house, he still has the easement because he's the beneficiary of the easement. Oh, okay. The easement has nothing to do with the house. Right, so he he could still have used the Correct. Lake, but I couldn't. Correct. I That's exactly right. They're two separate things. He can't sell you the right to use the lake because it's a personal easement in gross and those are non transferable. Uh, yeah. The only people who can sell you an easement to use the lake are the neighbors across the street. They can sell you one, but not subsequent owners. So you wouldn't be able to sell it either. Right. He just wanted the fish. He didn't want to keep the house. 
Right. He just wanted to be, and he could have after he sold the after. So what he could have done is sold the house and still maintain the right to go access right. the property because he would have right. still have he still has that easement. Right. So you know potentially what they were buying back from him is they just don't want him on their property right. anymore. Mm -hmm. But they could have created a new easement and sold it. To him. They can, right, and they still can. If you still if you want to have access to the lake, you can go knock on the door and you can buy an easement from them separately. Keep in mind it's only going to benefit you, right? So. If I were you, I'm not giving legal advice because I'm not an attorney. I wouldn't buy it personally. Create a corporation. Because if you get a corporation and have them sell an easement and gross to the corporation, and then your heirs inherit the corporation, would that easement and gross continue to exist as long as the corporation does? As long as they continue to file those documents every year with the North Carolina Secretary of State and keep that corporation in existence, how long would that easement and gross last? Hell of a long time, right? And when you sell the property, could you also sell the corporation with the property? Smart like that, ain't I? I've done this before. Someone's like, I've done this. Right? Does that help? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. I, I'm not giving legal advice. <laughs> a license is just permission. That's all it is. A license is permission. And permission can, it's not an easement, because permission can be given and what? Take, take it back. Whereas easements are much more permanent in nature. You know, easement is like, I'm giving you permission and, I'm, and it's done. Right? I can't take it back from you. Whereas a license is just temporary permission. And just like it can be given, it can be taken back. Right. Um, we talked about encroachments. An encroachment is any any improvement that extends across the property line. So anytime we see an improvement, and an improvement could be a fence, it could be a um, uh, it could be a shed, it could be a, a garage. I mean, people build structures that they just don't pay attention to where the property line is. Yes, go ahead. If I plant a tree in it, it yep. treads over to the other side. So, so if you plant a tree and indeed that tree does go over the property line, that is an encroachment. And any and any property owner has the right to remove encroachments on their land. So we get into this discussion with trees. Trees are a pain, quite honestly. Don't plant them close to the property line because it creates issues. Because any branches that overhang your neighbor's property, what can they do? They can cut them. And if that kills the tree, that kills the tree. Not only stuff above, but below. But below. You got a huge oak tree on your property, and the roots are tearing up the, dra the, the, the neighbor's driveway. What can they do? They can not not cut the tree down, but they can they can cut the roots. And will that kill the tree? And then whose responsibility monetarily is it going to be to deal with the dead tree? Yours, because it's on your property, it's your tree. So they can kill it and be 100% within their rights because it is encroaching on their property. Does that make sense? So, I mean, it's your property, and you can do and deal with these encroachments any way you see fit. From our perspective, we need to know that encroachments make both properties unmarketable. An encroachment is a really bad thing because it makes both properties, not just the one that's doing the encroaching, but actually both properties become unmark unmarketable as soon as we find this encroachment. And how would we find it? With a survey. The purpose of a survey, if you ever see that on a test, the purpose of a survey is to locate encroachments, to look for encroachments. Obviously we use it to mark the boundaries and how big the property is and where the property line is and all that sort of thing. But the absolute purpose of a survey is to look for encroachments, not to do all those other things. All those other things are side benefits of the survey, but the purpose is to look for the encroachments. Everybody feel okay about that? All right, the encroachments are really. You have to either remove the encroachment, or what can you get that would allow the encroachment to no longer be an encroachment, an easement? One of those two things. One of those two things. Because what, when we say unmarketable, what happens is the title insurance company won't issue title insurance on it. Once that, once that encroachment has been revealed, you're not getting the title insurance policy in most cases. 
unless they make it an exception on the title insurance, which you don't want either, because then that saying you're not covered in case this becomes an issue down there. Yes. You could go home today and your garage be collapsed on the ground. Yes, because that corner's gone. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. It's on their property. Not nice to do that, you know. In your case, it sounds like removing the encroachment is not going to be an issue. So the best issue is probably going to be an easement. An easement, which will require a survey of both properties which will, of course, the cost be borne by you because it's you who needs the easement. You know? um, and we have to do these relatively commonly as part of closings. I mean, sometimes they'll let us get away without doing the easement. Um, I have seen that happen from time to time. They'll get, a, you know, like a letter and get it notarized from the neighbor and that'll be good enough for the lender, title insurance company. But a lot of times they do require an easement. Yeah, that's Without knowing it. He probably didn't have what? Sure. So, uh, when you bought it? Or I, the, I didn't care. You didn't inherit it. Um, I'm assuming I did. Right. <laughs> no one did. Yeah, well, and that's what, and so that's what, there's a lesson right there. Mm -hmm. Why do you tell your clients they should have a survey done? To look for what? Encroachments. Encroachments. That's what we're looking for. And when I got into the business a thousand years ago, they were required. If you got a loan, you had to get a survey, period. Mm -hmm. Now they're not. Now, and the reason they were required was because the lender was not covered by your title insurance unless you had a survey done. That's the way, that's the, way the, the rules for title insurance used to work. The title insurance policy would not cover any encroachments that would have been revealed had you had a survey done. So the lender's response to that was to protect us, we don't care about you, but to protect us, you have to have a survey done to make sure there are no encroachments. Does that make sense for everybody? So, so that we're covered by the title insurance. About 10 years ago, the title insurance companies gave the lenders an exemption. They didn't give you an exemption though. So now the way it works is that if you don't have a survey, the title insurance will cover the lender's loss from the encroachment, but they will not cover the owner's loss from the encroachment. So is it still in your best interest as a buyer to have a survey done? Yes. Absolutely. And I would say now more so than ever, and every day that risk gets worse because the further in time we get away from when it was required to have one, what do you think's happened to the, the, here's the benefit of requiring a survey when you sell the house. What gets fixed pretty regularly? The encroachments, right? Because if you're having a survey done every time you sell a house, they find the encroachments, they deal with them. They either take them down or they get an easement or they do something. What happens when you go 10 years and every house in Raleigh doesn't have a survey done on it? What are people doing in the meantime? Are they putting fences up, putting sheds out there? They're encroaching. That's exactly right. There's a pretty high likelihood, folks, if you're looking at a property right now, that it's been 10, 15, 20 years since that property was surveyed. And you stand out there in that backyard and you look around and you think any of this stuff that was put here in the last 20 years could be encroaching on a property line. Do you need to have a survey? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And a lot of buyers don't do it because it's not required. As a broker, so now I'm going to give you a real world. What does that mean to you as a broker you should be doing? Advise, 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 advise your client that they should get a survey. And how are you going to advise them? In what format? Writing. In writing, said the attorney. In writing, right? You put it in writing so that if, you, if they ever, down the road, five years from now, they didn't get a survey and they find an encroachment, they come out and they want to sue you, you say, um, this is when I recommended that you have a survey and here's why. You just covered yourself. Even the attorneys, when they send letters to the buyers that are handling the settlement, will ask them. Would you like a survey? Yeah. Check this box and return it to our files. That's exactly right. They want a record that the buyer was offered the opportunity to get a survey. And that's the reason why. And like, like I said, many buyers will choose not to. We'll get it for you. It's not good. Um, many buyers will choose not to have them, and that's okay, as long as, again, it's the buyer making that choice. If you, whereas if you don't offer it as an option, who made the choice? The buyer. If, if I don't even offer it as an option, who made, I made the choice, the real estate agent. The real estate agent. 
So once you get that survey and they, the buyer agrees, don't you also have to, like if there's sheds and fences and whatever, you have to ask for permits to make sure all that's legal? Is that, is that well, the permitting way? process is a different process than looking for encroachments, but yeah, you would want to you want to see if there are permits for things like added, you know that have been added to the property as well. That's a different process than encroachments because something could be unpermitted and not encroaching. You know, it could be well within the property lines but still not okay. be permitted. Okay. Generally speaking, if something is permitted, it's not going to be an encroachment because part of the permitting process is you have to show them a survey that you've had done and where the thing is going to physically be located okay. to make sure it's not encroaching. Okay. That's part of the permitting process. Okay. Yes, ma'am. What happens if you're showing a house? Like, we looked at one house and there was a deck that was built and there's no way it was permitted. What would happen if we bought that house? Then you own an unpermitted deck. Mm. It was there, like, I mean, what do you, how did they do that? How are you able to sell something that's not permitted? Because you're willing to buy something that's not permitted. I mean, that's the short well, yeah, answer. Yeah, I mean, I just didn't know if the seller could get in trouble for it, or we could go back and be like, We haven't talked this? about this yet, but there's a, a, a Latin phrase that applies in this state. It's called caveat emptor. The translation is, let the buyer beware. And what that means in legal terms is that it's your responsibility as the buyer to make sure you know what you're buying and you're comfortable with what you're buying. Because the way a court of law is going to view that is, if you were concerned about this, why did you purchase it? And, and, and that's, a, that's a less than fulfilling answer for buyers, but it is the way it works in this state. And so, now, that doesn't apply for us because our job is to protect them. That's why they hire us. So we don't get to hide behind, let the buyer beware, but the, but the seller certainly does. The seller is just going to say, listen, I told you it wasn't permitted when I sold it to you. And if you were worried about that, then the time to deal with that was before you bought it from me. It's yours now. Have fun. But we, we, there are lots of unpermitted structures in this state. By the way, in Wake County, don't try it. You know what they use in Wake County now to look for unpermitted structures? Google Earth. Mm. Oh, yep. They do. They start, they look at those pictures and every time Google Earth updates those things, they have a computer that compares the images and if they see something new that popped up that's not permitted, they're paying a visit to your house. Yeah, so don't do it in Wake County. Don't do it anywhere, but definitely don't do it in Wake County. Okay? And what could they make you do if, you, if it's unpermitted? What could the county make you do? Tear it down. Tear it down. People ask me this question all the time. Well, we've finished our basement. You know, it's not permitted. You know, what can we do? Well, you can get it permitted. But remember, a permit is permission to do something. You've already done it, right? So you're going and asking them for permission to do what you already did. And don't forget that part of the reason you get a permit is so that they can come inspect the work mm -hmm. along the way you go in that finished basement do you think generally speaking part of those inspections would involve inspecting the plumbing and electrical work done it's hard to see that stuff behind that sheetrock folks you know what they'll say to you sure we need to see that stuff behind that sheetrock and you look at them and say well, what does that mean you figure it out <laughs> Because if you want us to permit it, we gotta look at it. We gotta put eyes on it. Could that get it? Could that get expensive? Yes. Yes. That could get very expensive, and does. So the risk of buying unpermitted space is that it will always be unpermitted, and that, you know, obviously, some buyers could take exception to that. Not only some buyers, some insurance companies. What if a fire starts in that unpermitted space? An electrical fire, and you never had that electrical system permitted. Are they going to pay that claim? No. Probably not. Very large risk of buying them from any space. Again, don't tell your buyer not to buy it. Tell them what the risk is and let them make the call. You do it in writing. But you've got a record of it. All right. Let's talk about property taxes. And for those of you who need like a minute to collect yourself for math, I'm giving you like 15 minute warning. Here it comes. Okay? <laughs> math is on the horizon. Start doing the yoga now, right? Uh, <laughs> property taxes. In North Carolina, we use what's called an ad valorem property tax, which means that properties are taxed based on their market value. It's a market value approach 
to property taxation. Not some percentage of market value, but full market value. Some states use percentages of market value, and you'll see that in the math examples. And we'll talk about how to deal with that from a math perspective. But here in North Carolina, we use full market value when we talk about property taxation. The problem, though, with that approach is that we never can really, and, and the law is called the Machinery Act. I don't know why it's called the Machinery Act that governs property taxation, but you do need to know that for the test. The law that sets up how we do property taxes in North Carolina is called the Machinery Act. The problem with our approach here in North Carolina, it's not that it, it's, there's anything wrong with using 100% of market value. It's when we use 100% of market value, people tend to confuse the tax value with the current market value. And that is a mistake. And here's why that's a mistake. We only come up with a market value for tax purposes once every eight years. Do property values change within an eight-year period? Oh, yeah. Yes, but the tax value, the assessed tax value, is going to be locked on these properties for eight years. That's what we mean when we say we have an octennial reappraisal. An octennial is once every eight years. Reappraisal means the property is visited and we have a new appraisal done on it. So once every eight years, every property in Wake County, whether it be a house, a warehouse, an office building, a piece of vacant land is going to be visited by an appraiser. And each property is going to be valued individually. And what is that appraiser trying to predict? What it would sell for what? Right that day. And that becomes that property's assessed tax value for how long of a period of time? Eight years. Eight years. No matter whether the market goes up, or down, that assessed tax value is going to be locked in for that eight year period. Does that make sense for everybody? Does that right away point out to you why it doesn't matter to me what the tax value of a property is if I'm trying to sell the property? Because that's a value that was, could be up to eight years ago, could be four years ago, could be two years ago, depending on where we are in that cycle. Do I care what it was worth three years ago or do I care what it's worth today? I care what it's worth today. You're going to run into this your entire career, whether the market's going up or whether the market's going down. Because when the market's going up, every buyer wants to port it. Well, with the tax value, use this. <laughs> when the market collapses, guess what? <laughs> the sellers will say, with the tax value, use this. <laughs> guess what? It makes no sense from either party. Because the value is the value as of that day, not the assessed tax value. Does that make sense for everybody? Don't use it for anything other than tax calculation purposes. That's the only thing it's there for. Don't use it as a guideline. Oh, well, everything's selling basically for tax. Shut up. Stop. <laughs> no. If you are talking about some function of tax value, you're talking about the wrong thing as far as value for selling a property. Okay? That's horrible advice to give a client. Don't do it. It's lazy. It's not the way we do our job. This is only used for purposes of calculating a tax bill. That's it. Now, just because the assessed tax value does not change over the eight year period, does that mean that the tax bill itself does not change over that eight year period? No. What, what could change from year to year? The tax what? The rate. The percentage that you're being charged off of that assessed value can change from year to year. And therefore the tax bill itself can certainly go up or down, up, up during that eight year period, even if the tax value itself stays the same. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So how often are we re revisiting these properties? Eight every eight years. And every county is on a different cycle, by the way. Generally speaking, neighboring counties try not to do this at the same time because there are only so many appraisers to go around. Can you imagine if Wake, Durham, and Orange County all decided to have their octennial reappraisal at the same time? There would never be enough appraisers. So they're all on differing cycles with each other. Wake's assessment was done in 2016, so we're only two years into, not even quite two years into the assessment cycle. Um, so we're fairly recent on the Wake um, values. Um, but if you think about that, that means the previous one in Wake County was done when? 
2008. Now, I know some of you are like 12 years old, so you won't know this, but <laughs> those of you that are older, what was going on in the real estate market around 2007, 2008? So if I was selling a property in 2010, what was the sales price probably looking like in comparison to that tax value? Terrible, right? The tax value was probably a lot higher than the sales price. How many people do you think were going down to the Wake County Tax Office saying, if you think my house is worth this, you can pay me for it? I mean, I mean, you think they got tired of hearing that argument down there at the tax assessor's office? You know what's funny? Is that nobody's going down there today going, oh, by the way, you have my house so undervalued. Nobody's doing that. They don't make that argument at the tax assessor's office. Here's the thing, they don't care. They don't care that the tax value is different than your current market value because what they care about is, was the market value fair at the time we did the valuation? If you start engaging in this conversation of, well, this tax value is not fair because my house is not worth this, you're having the wrong conversation because the first thing you need to know is, when was the assessment done? And was that a fair number when that assessment was done? Does that make sense for everybody? I think Durham is coming up, actually, this year. I think, I think 18 is Durham County. How does it pertain to like new construction? How does it pertain to new construction? What do you think the tax value is going to be of new construction? We, do, we are a full market value state. So what do you think the tax value is going to be? Sales, sales, price. sales price. What you pay for it. That's the tax value. Until At least the additional one. I'm sorry? Until it's, Until it's assessed. Until it's assessed, Until it's assessed and it's going to be assessed when everything else is assessed at the next octennial reappraisal. So it's going to, they're going to set it at that number until the next assessment comes along because they don't have any other number. Now, one thing you do have to watch out for with buying new construction is historically, what do you think the best way to fare what your property taxes next year are going to be? Look at what they were last year, right? Because generally speaking, they're not going to change the rate dramatically from one year to the next. And so we know the assessed value is going to stay the same. If the rate stays roughly the same, then the bill is going to stay roughly the same. Does that make sense for everybody? When you're buying new construction, if you look at last year's tax bill, what kind of tax bill are you looking at for what? Just the property. Vacant land. Is that going to be a little bit um, different than what you're going to pay the following year? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. And Buyers can sometimes get caught by surprise with that. Builders love to do this and take it. This is why you don't use that builder attorney, by the way. Just a, no, no, I know. I know. I know. But, but I, um, this is one of those reasons I point this out. When we go to closing, we start prorating out. Y'all know what a proration is when you start splitting expenses, right? So you start looking at, okay, here's what the property tax bill is. And the seller's going to pay up through the day of closing, and the buyer's going to pay the rest of the year. Well, what really happens is the buyer pays when the bill comes out. Mm -hmm. So the seller pays their estimated share up through the day of closing, and the, bill, the buyer's just going to pay the bill when the bill comes out. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. What do you think we're estimating the seller's share based off of in most cases? Just the way right. Last year's tax bill. Wow. Is the buyer's bill going to be based off last year's tax <laughs> bill when it comes? And who's going to end up getting paid, paying all of that? It ain't the seller, I can the tell you. It's the buyer. And the truth is, for especially in some cases, could that house have already been completed for three or four months before the buyer buys it? Sure. The seller's not going to share in that expense because they're going to estimate based on That's why you use a different closing attorney because they'll, they catch stuff like that sometimes. Okay? Do we understand this? We need to talk about a horizontal adjustment. A horizontal adjustment. This is changing the tax value midway. Well, what did we say full away was? Eight Every years. eight years, right? So midway would be what? Four Every four. This is different than a reappraisal, though. In a reappraisal, what did I say was going to happen with each property? Visited. They're going to be visited and valued what? Individually. So could you have this property go up in value and the one next door go down in value, presumably? Because they're valued individually. Yes, a horizontal adjustment does not work that way. As a matter of fact, if the county decides to do a horizontal adjustment, which Wake County has already said they're going to do in 2020, by the way. We're only two years in and they've already said they're going to do one in 2020. A horizontal adjustment is an across-the-board, up-or-down adjustment 
by the same percentage amount for every property. They do not they don't visit the properties again. We're not individually valuing the properties. We're just simply saying the market is changing so quickly that we can't wait eight years to reassess. So, middle of the road, we're going to raise every property's assessed value by 5% or 10%. But it's going to be an across the board, every property gets the same treatment. Does that make sense? You can't appeal that. You cannot. There is no appeal of a horizontal adjustment because it's the same application of every property across the board. You can appeal the octennial reappraisal because that's an individualized thing. We okay on that? Y'all got off quiet. You scared me. <laughs> Do we get the difference between a horizontal adjustment and and a octennial reappraisal? Is it just because they want more money? Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> be honest, Travis. <laughs> be honest. Yes, they always want more money. Um, they could adjust the rate. It's a political thing, quite honestly. The county has the ability to raise more money every single year because the rate is set on a yearly basis. Who sets the rate, though? County who? Treasurer. Commissioners. Commissioners. And they have to do what every November or every two November? Yeah. Yeah. Run for office. Who wants to be the guy running saying, I raised your property tax yeah. rates? Right? <laughs> so, if you're on the Wake County Board of Commissioners and you need more revenue in Wake County, what's easier? Voting for higher property tax rates or just simply having the county do a horizontal adjustment of assessed values but leave the rate alone. Or, sneaky politicians would never do this, <laughs> could we raise the assessed values, slightly lower the rate, and still actually give you a bigger bill every year and say, we voted for lower taxes for you. We lowered your tax rate. Could we do that? If you don't think so, folks, you better pay, pay attention. Because that's exactly what they do. They run that campaign and say, we lowered your tax rate. Well, shit, my bill went up. How'd that happen? Because <laughs> they did a horizontal adjustment. And they raised the assessed value. But they raised the assessed value more than they lowered the rate. So when you do the math, what happens to the bill? It goes up. Politics. <laughs> Can't live with it. Can't live with it. Can't live without it. Right? Okay? Everybody good on this? This idea? Now, you need to know this time frame, this timeline is really important when it comes to property taxes in the state of North Carolina. Property taxation in the state of North Carolina is really important on this timeline. So, I've put years in here. These are just kind of like placeholder years. It's the same every year. Um, so, it says, on January 1 of 2016, your 2016 property taxes would have become a lien. So we're in 2018 right now, correct? Mm -hmm. When did my 2018 property taxes become a lien on my home? January, January 1. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Look when they're billed. Not until when? September. September. So it's a lien and we don't even know for how much. It's a lien a full nine months before you even know how much the lien is for. I don't know how they do that, but they do because they're the law. They can do whatever they want to do. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. So my 2018 property taxes are already a lien against my property. If I wanted to pay that lien, I couldn't because I have no idea how much it is. What would be the... Now that, that creates a problem. If we have a closing in February, mm -hmm. does the seller owe some property taxes? Yeah. Yeah. Sure they do because the clock's running right now. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Do we know how much they owe? No. We have no earthly idea. So what are we going to use to estimate it? Last year's, Last year's, year's bill. It's the best thing we got. Last year's bill. Ever follow on that? January 6th of the following year is when they are delinquent. So my 2018 property taxes that are already lean on my property must be paid no later than January 5th of 2019. If they're not, then they are delinquent as of January 6th of 2019. And what, do you, what process do you think the county could begin as of January 6th? The foreclosure process. So does that mean most housing. foreclosures happen at the beginning of the year then? Most foreclosures are not tax related. Oh, okay. There are very few tax related foreclosures and that actually has to do with lien priority. Go back to that lien priority thing. 
Think about who gets paid in what order. But who do we say sits at the top? County tax. taxes. Taxes, right? And then in the middle, who's in the middle? Mortgages. Here's the problem with the foreclosure process. If Wake County forecloses on my home because they're owed $4,000 in property taxes, how much does Wake County want to sell the house for? $4,000. $4,000. Do they care that there's another $200,000 in mortgage sitting out there? No. They do not. So, at that foreclosure auction, what is Wake County looking for as a high bid? Four grand. If Wake County is not paid their taxes, who stands to lose the most if that property goes to foreclosure? The lender, the mortgage company. So guess who's going to pay the taxes, even if I don't? The lender. You think they might have a clause in my mortgage note that even if I'm current on my mortgage but I don't pay my property taxes, they can still foreclose on me? And that's what would happen. They would pay the taxes and then they would foreclose on me because they would be driven to make sure the property sold for enough to cover their note. So you see, I'm sorry. Oh, they will give you time to pay it. Sure. Hey, if you don't get, if you don't, if you don't pay your insurance, they'll buy insurance for you. You don't want them to buy insurance for you because it will be very expensive and conveniently sold to you by a subsidiary owned by them. But that all assumes that those two items aren't escrowed. That assumes they're not escrowed. Correct. If they're escrowed. I mean, and they're collecting for you mm -hmm. your taxes and insurance, then they're going to pay them for you anyway out of the escrow account. And that's what most of us do. Most of us escrow our property taxes and insurance so we don't get hit with that big bill one time a year. It's thousands of dollars. You know, most people do not want to pay to write a check for thousands of dollars in December for property taxes. So most people do escrows. All right? And of course, the lender loves the escrows because it protects them, number one because they know they have the money to pay the taxes, number two. Can they earn interest on those escrow accounts all during the year? Yeah, they can. They sure can. So Travis, if, it's, if, it, if you get your tax bill in September, and then you don't pay it until, let's say, January 1st, is there interest that you owe on that as well? There is not. No. It is not delinquent, okay. again, until January 6th. And that's when you would start to assess any sort of penalties, interest, all okay. that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so most people don't pay them until December. Why do you think most people pay them in December rather than January? Income taxes. Because you want the deduction, the tax deduction, which could change. And there are counties that have talked about this with the new tax plan because the standard deduction has gone up and there's a limitation on how much in property taxes you can write off. There could be some people who are not as motivated to pay them in December anymore. And so counties have actually talked about how does that change their revenue dynamic if all of a sudden they're now collecting much more in taxes in January than they used to be because people were always motivated to pay them in December rather than. You know, so it does change some things. All right, do we understand this timetable? So, yes. I have a question. As far as like on a tax, um, the card, whenever we went to sell our home, mm -hmm. our home actually on that card was completely wrong. I mean, the number of bathrooms were wrong, the yep. number of bedrooms, everything. We had a finished basement, it said partial finish, you know, and so whenever we went to sell our home, the guy that was buying it, we did not have an agent, we just done it, you know, between the two of us, he was like, well, the tax value is this, and then whenever I started looking at the actual, what they had on there, so then he said, well, you want to go to the tax assessor's office to get all this straight, you know, and I thought, well, you know, do I or do I not, so we did. And they was like, well, this has been wrong for years. But then they wanted to, uh-oh. Uh -oh. uh -oh. uh, wrong works in two directions, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I wrong. was like, we're selling it. We're out of here. You know, right. but, I mean, honestly, because it was listed as a three-bedroom house with a partial basement, not a full basement, and then it was only one bathroom compared to two bathrooms, you know, and they were like, well, did you add this? No. So it was like. Most li how long did you own the house? <sighs> um, six years. Most likely, mm -hmm. whoever owned the house before you or some previous owner did that work and it's unpermitted. Mm -hmm. That's why it differs so greatly mm -hmm. from what they have to what you have. One of the dangers, in addition to the insurance and all that sort of thing, they found out that it's significantly different. What did they make it clear they could have done to you? They could make you pay mm -hmm. the back taxes on all of that stuff for the whole time it's been that way. 
They could have figured out what the unpaid level of property taxes was for that intervening time period and billed you for it with penalties and interest. So if you have a situation that you're trying to list a house and you pull the tax card and it is completely wrong, what do you do? Do you advise the seller or do you buy, advise the buyer? Hey, Both. Okay. Both. You know, my job is to my job is to protect the public. So I'm going to tell both of them that it is my suspicion that we've got some unpermitted space going on here. You know that this differs significantly from the tax records and what the county has, and that usually is a sign of unpermitted. Especially if what they have is dramatically lower than what you're seeing in person. If you go, if you ever go measure a house and you measure 2,200 square feet and you look on the county tax records and it's 1,500 square feet. They did not miss it that much initially, I can tell you. Somebody has added on something over the years and not gotten a permit for it. Because if they had a permit for it, it would be on the tax record cards because they would be taxing you for it. And that's their major concern with unpermitted square footage. They, oh, they'll tell you, oh, it's for the public safety baloney. It's because they haven't been taxing you on it. And they want the money. And they can get it. And they get it from the current owner. It doesn't matter whether you did it or you did If they look at current owner, and by the way, when they find out it's unpermitted, you're relying on them to estimate when it was actually done. Because they are allowed to go back. If they say it was done like 20 years ago, they can bill you for that, you know, the, the intervening period for that whole thing. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's a, it does get to be, it's a big deal. So, it, you know, it's one of those things where doing your due diligence and having an inspection and having an appraisal and having it measured and comparing it to what the permits are that are out there is a big deal because once you bought it, it's yours. Please come with a dog. They sure do. Always. Maybe. <laughs> but you can clean the poop up. You can't get rid of the right. leaves. You, know, you keep picking them off and keep them flinching. All right? How do we feel about that so far? Okay. So why don't we do this? Let's stop for our lunch break. And when we come back, bring your calculator with you. Because we're going to start math. If you don't already have a calculator, go to Walmart and get one on your lunch break. Okay? So it is, uh, let's see, uh, come back at uh, 10 minutes to 2. I'll find it home. It's only like $10. But I left my order on here.